Hello, today we're going to discuss the optimal field procedures and office processing techniques to get your drone photogrammetry point cloud looking like this to looking like this. I performed four different flights on this residential property. The first being nadir at an elevation of 60 meters, so the camera was pointed straight down. That was a single grid mission. The second being a double grid mission at the camera pointing at 80 degrees from the horizon, 10 degrees from nadir, this again at 60 meters. The third flight was again a double grid, this time the camera was pointed 60 degrees from the horizon, 30 degrees from nadir, and at 40 meters. And then the last and fourth flight was a circular mission at 30 meters with the camera pointed at the house in the middle. For each mission processing, I used seven ground control points, which I tied with RTK GPS and a few of them I also tied in with a total station and did a least squares adjustment to tighten everything up. I typically saw about one to one and a half centimeters of residuals between the GCPs. So going into this, I was expecting the oblique images to produce a better point cloud as they can see under obstructions like trees and roofs, but I wasn't certain that they would be able to produce as good of an ortho image. I was also expecting the circular flight to significantly improve the point cloud as it's the angle of the camera is much more significant when compared to nadir so it would be able to further look underneath height obstructions like roofs and trees. So let's look into the data and figure out what combination of flights or which flights just by themselves per, per, can produce the best imagery and also produce the best point cloud. So let's start off by looking at the nadir point cloud. This flight was flown at 60 meters and as you can expect there isn't a lot of coverage underneath the roofs. Uh, it didn't pick up the trees very well, and it also did not pick up any of the power poles at all. And you can see along the back, in between the house and the bus there, and in between the trailer and the retaining wall, it didn't do a great job at resolving the true ground in those, or I should say the true surface in those situations. So next, let's take a look at the double grid. So this was flown at the same elevation. Just going to increase my point size. This was flown at the same elevation. Uh, this time it's a double grid. So there's perpendicular flight lines. And the camera was pointed at 80 degrees. So you can see there's a significant improvement on the side of the house. Uh, I still wasn't able to capture in between the trailer you can see I'm starting to get a little bit in this narrow gap here the house looks pretty rough though you can see the uh, the corner of the house is pretty jagged right here it didn't do a great job and it really did a pretty poor job along this lower roof here the trees are okay it's starting to fill in fences and you can see it just started to get the power poles. So let's take a look at another double, double grid. This time it's 60 degrees. So that's 60 degrees from the horizon, 30 from nadir, and a bit lower. Again, I'm just gonna turn up the point size. Okay, so it looks like it filled in this gap here that we were having issues with on the last flight. The corner of the house is looking more true. It did a little better in between the bus and the house it looks like. Yeah, just a little bit better, not a, not a huge difference. And 
it definitely got a lot more of the power pull. You can even see that it's starting to get the transformer now. So it did do a better job. Still not fantastic. It's starting to get underneath this overhang over here, which is pretty impressive. And picked up the back. So the next processing I did was I combined these three flights together to see if that would make any difference. So I'm going to set that to three. <clears throat> and it looks like it, uh, it did a little bit better. Not a massive difference. The corner of the buildings look okay. It actually, surprisingly enough, the issue of this area here came back when it wasn't there on the last flight, which is interesting. So I guess it's picking up some distortion from the second or first flight because they both struggled in that area and the third flight didn't. So that's interesting to note. So next we combined all four flights with the fourth flight being the circular flight that was flown at 30 meters. And it was pointed a lot closer to the horizon. It still didn't pick up the horizon, but the camera, camera angle was much more, uh, much further from Nadir. So you can see that this this flight here significantly improved things. It picked up a lot more of the fence. It uh, got underneath this covered area a little bit better. You're still seeing a lot of erroneous points. This is wide open here in reality and yet it's filling it in with points, which is interesting. It's starting to get underneath this roof peak and it really did a good job getting under the trees and again the power poles look pretty good you can see a lot more of the fences picked up so let's compare this to just flight three only yeah you can see with the circular it's picking up a lot more data in here And what's impressive about this one is it almost fully mapped the ground beside the bus there. It still wasn't able to quite pull, uh, pull up a good resolution behind the trailer though. And it's starting to get the tree. So what conclusions can we make from what we're seeing so far? So what I can tell from looking at this data set is that it's no surprise that as the camera gets lower, and the angle gets more oblique, that is to say further away from nadir, you're able to create a better 3D model of structures because you're able to not only map the tops, but you're also able to map the sides and underneath obstructions as well. Whereas nadir only, generally it's pretty tough for the camera to see underneath, underneath height obstructions, like there for example. So what we're seeing right now is that flights one through four combined are producing the best point cloud. So what I did was I took that data set, brought it back in Agisoft and processed the point cloud under high quality. I generally do medium quality because there is a significant increase in processing time from the jump from medium to high. And this is where I was actually quite surprised with the results. So when I compare the medium quality to high quality processed point cloud, obviously the high quality one is much more dense. Uh, for example, the medium quality point cloud has 15 million points, where the high quality point cloud has almost 60 million points, which I did expect. But what I was surprised about was how it was able to process the point cloud in areas that would typically be difficult for photogrammetry 
and get fairly accurate results. So right now we're looking at the medium quality and the two things that jump out at me at, at this particular area is that it wasn't able to process down to the ground here. You have significant fuzz up here and it wasn't able to get behind the trailer. So let's take a look and see what the high quality looks like. So you can see there's still a little bit of fuzz up here, but it almost entirely mapped the bottom, the uh, ground surface in between the house and the bus here, which is pretty impressive. It's a very narrow area for it to reach in between. So that's quite impressive. And even more so, it was able to get down on the ground in between the wheel and the retaining wall back here, which I was actually pretty floored by. It's a it's a very narrow gap and it was able to get the ground over there. If I sw switch back to medium, you can see there's there's nothing nothing over there. It just it could not do it. Here is another example of where the high quality really excelled. So I have the high quality turned on right now and you can see it was able to map out quite a bit of this concrete pad underneath this tent here. If I switch back to the medium quality, it really wasn't able to get any of that at all. There's a little bit of data in there, but I would not trust it. Switching back to the high quality, you can see it has a fairly uniform surface down there. So one final example between the two. Right now I have the medium quality point clouds set to on. So I want you to pay attention to this area over here, this wheelbarrow on its side here and this pot over here. So you can see it really sucks in the ground surface beside all these features. I'm able to even get in between the wheelbarrow and the shed here, and it picked up that there's a divot here around this, this uh, it's a potted plant. It just, it got so much more details when set to high quality. Even the shed, you can look at the roof, like obviously it doesn't come down at a triangle like that. The photogrammetry is doing the best it can. And that, you're still seeing some of that, but it's a lot better. The edges of the, the structure are a lot more plumb. Just the overall quality, there's less noise. It's just a real, real significant improvement under high. Okay, let's talk about accuracy of vertical faces. So the point of this video was really to be able to map vertical faces and underneath horizontal, sorry, underneath uh, vertical obstructions like roofs and trees. We all know how to fly a nadir site and map the ground fairly decently. It's nothing new there. We would like to be able to to go beyond that. So I set a series of vertical targets which were just uh, corrugated black and white plastic targets in a two by four holder on the ground in areas i thought would be very difficult for the drone to map so i have one underneath the entrance roof here right beside the house i have one on the corner of the house over here and uh, one right in a small area beside the fence and underneath the deck overhang. So I wasn't quite exactly sure how well I'd be able to uh, coordinate these with the point cloud. But the whole point of this is to pick the areas that you want to pick the areas that are going to be the toughest to accurately map because that's a better depiction of your true accuracy versus something that's wide out in the open. I want to know how bad am I in the worst possible situation and use that as a claimed accuracy, not pick a control point that I know is going to be accurate and use that as a claimed accuracy. I want to know the worst possible results I'm going to give. So I believe this is target one. I have a CSV here. So all these targets I shot in reflectorlessly with a total station. I processed that data through a least squares adjustment, so these are going to be accurate to a few mils. But of course, we're just picking points here. I'm not like if I pick this point again, I may or may not pick the same point. I'm just kind of roughly eyeing up where I can see a black square and a white square and picking the intersection of all those four squares. 
in the best possible situation, it would be centimeter accuracy. If I get anything under five centimeters, I'm going to be happy here. So let's start off with target one. So our easting ends in 0.76. So I'm a centimeter off in the easting, point a centimeter off in the northing, and round that up to A1, a centimeter off in the elevation. So that's actually pretty shocking how well that worked, very shocking how well that worked out considering it's actually underneath this roof here. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. I believe this is target four over here. So this one is a bit easier. It's uh, it's still underneath the roof up here, but it's a lot more out in the open just for full transparency. So easting ends in 6.0. So we're four mils a centimeter out in the easting. That ends in 5.5. We're two centimeters out in the northing. And the elevation rounds up to 8.8, .8, two centimeters out in the elevation. So same kind of thing. We're looking two, maybe three centimeters horizontally, two vertically. And this one I knew was going to be extremely tough. It's underneath the deck overhang. It's bounded by this fence on this side and this fence on this side. I'm actually shocked. You can see there is a lot of noise here, which is very, it's absolutely expected. It was still able to map the ground here, which is pretty amazing. But not only that, it mapped the target. So we're able to do a little comparison here. I'm actually pretty shocked it even picked it up. So this is target five. So easting ends in seven zero. So we're one centimeter off in the easting. Northing ends in one two. Round up to one one. One centimeter off in the northing. And the elevation ends in seven five. So seven two. So three centimeters off in the elevation. So Based on these three targets alone, we could say our accuracy is hovering around three centimeters horizontally, three centimeters vertically for our vertical faces, which is very good considering this is photogrammetry. And as one last way of doing a bit of ground truthing, I'm going to digitize the building and export it into AutoCAD and compare those results from the total station shots I had on the house. So it's pretty easy to do in the point cloud viewer. Just gonna refine this shot. You basically just draw distances and uh, export it as a DXF. So I think everything looks good. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna export this as a DXF and then bring that into AutoCAD and compare it to my total station shots. Okay, so I'm in Civil 3D now. I just brought in that line work, set it at a zero elevation and filleted the corners. And so these are shots I that were taken on the outside trim of the house with the total station. So I can just check the distances in between. What do I got here? Three cents and two cents. Uh, so four centimeters overall. Here, uh, 24 mil. This one looks like it might be a bit bigger. 48 mil. And house corner upper. That's pretty good. 10 mil. So yeah, any I'm really just looking for anything under five centimeters here. Like th this is a point cloud. And if I were to shoot the bottom of the house corner or the top of the house corner near the roof, I'm sure I get two different values. Houses aren't built perfect. Houses aren't plumb. This is the trim, you know, there's a lot of variables that go in. Anything under five centimeters, I'm perfectly happy with for this application. And for my one last check, just to make sure my verticals turned out okay, I'm gonna do a bit of a comparison between, I took some, uh, let's see, I took some reflectorless shots just on the ground. So this one was just on the concrete surface right around here. So I'm gonna run a quick profile 
So I'd say it's right about there. If I look at my Z value, I'm 41.58 with a bit of fluctuation. And my total station shot was 41.59. So it's a centimeter off there, which is kind of what I expected. I also took a shot on the concrete pad under this, uh, this patio in here. Let's close that up. And I did this because I knew it was going to have a hell of a time defining, or sorry, uh, processing the points underneath here. And I thought it would be a, a good challenge to uh, check how accurately I could get, get those points. So let's bring up a profile. And so I can see I'm sitting around 41.82. Yeah, 41.82, kind of right in the middle there. Let's see what I have here. 41.83. Yeah, so uh, 828, not bad. So a centimeter off, and that's underneath. That's underneath this uh, this paper patio here. So that's actually really impressive. Of course, of course, there's a lot of noise above it, but you. This the third dimension point cloud viewer allows you to cut through that noise and you know pick out the the lowest elevation. So yeah, not not too bad. Okay, so what's the next conclusion we can draw from all this? I'm comfortable saying that I can define vertical surfaces to within five centimeters. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn on on that based on what I'm seeing here. Of course, every scenario is gonna be different, but based on the methods I used and the processing techniques I used, I'm comfortable saying I could define vertical surfaces to within five centimeters, usually better. And even more than that, what really shocked me, and I wasn't expecting this, was to be able to define uh, horizontal surfaces underneath structures to within a few centimeters. That really blew me away. I did not see that coming so yeah overall the point cloud is greatly improved by oblique images i guess that's the main takeaway oblique images greatly improve it and having the ability to access the parameters at in which you process your point cloud so i know if you're using a cloud-based service, you may not have access to these settings. I'm not a huge fan of cloud-based uh, point cloud processing. I used Agisoft Metashape and I've, I've used Pix4D in the past. I'm a big, big fan of Agisoft and being able to buy a perpetual license is also a huge plus, not having that, that monthly bill. I'm not, I'm not paid by Agisoft in any way and I paid for my license, but those are just my thoughts. So next we're going to take a look at ortho imagery and figure out if all those oblique images played a, played a uh, negative impact on Agisoft's ability to create an ortho image. Okay, so I have the ortho image brought in from the Nadir flight and I have it brought in as a TIFF and also I have it brought in as an ECW. It's just reload that so you can see there's a significant file size difference between the two i'm a big fan of ecw's uh, ecw stands for enhanced compression wavelet it's a near lossless compression format of a tiff uh, they're smaller so they take up less room on your hard drive and they are much quicker to use in the drawings this might not be a great example of them being quicker to use in the drawing because it's still a relatively small tiff but it's it's still apparent and the quality difference is negligible so i'll give you a bit of an example here so you can kind of see there's a bit of lag going on this is the tiff uh, if i unload that and load up my ecw it's you can it's hard to tell it's a bit quicker but it once, trust me, once you get into larger images, it makes a really big difference. So let's look at some quality comparison differences to make sure we're not losing a ton of detail. Uh, we'll go into the chicken coop, for example. 
So that's what it looks like on the ECW to give you an idea of resolution. And let's unload that and reload the TIFF. So you can see there's almost no difference. So that's the ECW. That's the TIFF. Very, very minor differences. And I'm not exactly sure why, but the TIFF seems to be shifted a little bit. I don't know if you noticed it jumping back and forth. Here's one of my GCPs. You can see it's a little bit off there. If I turn that off and load up my ECW, it's spot on. I, I always use ECWs. I'm not a fan of TIFF. I don't see the benefit. It's... To the human eye, you're never going to see a difference between the quality. It's it's very very rare, and there's just so many so many benefits of using an ECW. So, yeah, you can see the GCPs are all pretty much right on when it comes to the ECW. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do my best to summarize what I'm seeing with these with the imagery in a concise manner. So right now I have the Nadir image selected. You can see it. there's some leaning to the fencing. Um, it's shaving off the corners of the buildings. And it's really struggling in certain places. It's not bad. But um, it's not great either. So I was kind of expecting this to do the best out of all of them because... An ortho image is nadir and all these images were nadir but that's not what i really found so the next flight that i processed that was most oblique so let's bring that up you can see it actually filled in the corners pretty well so the, right now we're looking at the double grid at 60 degrees it picked up the gutter here the corners of the roofs look okay. Let's bring back the nadir. Didn't pick up the gutter. And it's the roof line is very jagged. Um, so right now we're looking at the 60 degree. You can see there's some wonkiness going on with the fence there. Uh, it really struggled with the power lines. The power pole. There's a lot of... It's a bit of a mess. So kind of just to jump to the end, um, by far the best results were again flights one through four on high. So let's unload everything and let's load that up. So you can see, remember the nadir really struggled around here. It did a very good job. The uh, fence is very plumb versus all the other ones. Uh, for example, if we look in this area let's bring up the nadir you can see it's obviously not plumb take it away and it cleans it right up uh, the corners of buildings so this is flights one through four we're seeing now bring in the nadir yeah it just really rounds off take away the nadir and it really tightens it up that's a very tight corner right there yeah I could keep going through uh, different examples of what I'm seeing but it really did by far the best job with it, I guess it was just all that the extra overlapping imagery so another win for flights one through four high but I should also mention if it's just flights one through four it's still flights one through four outperformed everything else but it it lacked significantly behind one through four on high so this is one through four normally let's reload one through four high and you can see much tighter corners again taking it away uh, let's go over here so yeah you can see even even one through four not on high it really struggled over here on high and it just really tightened it up so it's really processing has a lot to do with the quality of outputs as does your field procedures so you can't ignore one or the other one through four still beat everything else 
just based on the better field procedures, but the processing really gave it that last little extra bit of accuracy. So obviously we can't fly each site with four different kinds of flights each time. Uh, the flight time's too long, batteries are too short, and it's just not efficient. And not to mention that the processing time on the high quality setting took six days, which is just unacceptable. Um, there are ways to improve that with uh, better hardware, but the processing computer I'm using is no slouch. It's, it was designed to process photogrammetry, albeit it's five years old and I could probably squeeze a lot more out of it. And that will probably be a topic of a future video, but that's just not acceptable. So we need to figure out a compromise to maintain accuracy and reduce field time and processing time. So what is the answer to this problem? So I've processed flights two and four under high and one and four under high and nadir alone under high. So let's look at flights two and four under high first. That's the oblique at 60 meters and 80 degrees. So let's toggle that on and toggle off one through four. So the, the issue areas were beside the trailer and beside the bus. And you can actually see there's virtually no difference. In fact, one could argue there might even be less noise on the two and four, which is pretty surprising. It's, it's tough to say. I'd almost say they're, they're almost identical. Um, if we go over and look underneath the paver patio as well. So right now we're looking at flights two and four high and we'll toggle back to one through four and yeah, you could almost make the argument that two and four, which we're looking at now are better. Of course it didn't get this side of the shed and that's because the circular mission didn't get quite far enough out to get that side, but you still have the corners. You could still digitize it fine. Uh, I see pretty much the same thing on one and four high. It's the difference is negligible. I, some spots are better than the two and four. Some spots are worse. I wouldn't say there's much of a difference. And if we look at the nadir alone under high, just to confirm, it's not only the processing techniques that are making all the difference. You can see, again, we lose too much of the sides of the structures, the vertical faces for this to be useful for what we're trying to do. So what conclusion can we make? We can make the conclusion that really those low oblique shots that the circular mission provided made all the difference in the world. That was, that's kind of the key here. It's not necessarily a massive overlap of a ton of imagery, but it's that low oblique imagery that really pulls things together combined with the high quality processing. Okay. So let's look at the ortho imagery right now. We have one through four high on. And let's turn that off and load up the two and four high. So you can see right along here, it does a very good job. Let's bring back one and four again. It might do a little bit better in some places, but the two and four might do better in other places. So it's not so clear cut. Let's look at the corner of a building. So right now we have two and four high. Let's bring back one through four. It might be a little bit better, but again, the difference is negligible. And let's try one and four, which is the nadir. So you can see the quality degrades quite a bit with a nadir only. Let's bring back two and four. And yeah, that cleaned it up a lot. So that was quite surprising that the nadir and the circular oblique did not produce a better ortho photo. And in fact, flights two and four could arguably produce the 
best quality point cloud and orthophoto. So just to reiterate, flights two and four, that was the oblique at 60 meters at 80, see at 60 meters at an 80 degree angle with the circular flight combined in with it. So let's take a look at the processing time on what seems to be giving us the best results so far. So this is two and four processed under high quality and our processing time, it's still on the high side. It's uh, 18 hours for the map generation, depth, map, depth maps generation time and another six hours for dense cloud generation. So we're looking at 24 hours for the dense cloud um, 11 minutes to align the photos, which is negligible and, uh, a minute for the DM seven minutes for the ortho photo. So we're looking at, at about a day of processing time, which can be a lot for a small site, but it's manageable. And again, there are ways we can significantly reduce that time, which I'll go over in a later video. So if I were to make a recommendation on everything I've seen here, and I were to fly this site again and going forward in the future, choosing my field procedures and processing techniques, I would lean towards doing a double grid at a low angle and then also getting some low elevation oblique images that have a significantly steep angle to the horizon. That is to say far from nadir you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting a good quality point cloud. You're getting a good quality ortho photo. You're getting low flight times. The combined flight times for both of these flights on a project that's, I'd say about four acres. Uh, the flight time combined, I'm looking at 15 minutes for both flights. Uh, the processing time took a day, but that can be reduced. And that would give us the best results. I understand for a larger area in the several hundred acres, if you're using a quadcopter, you might lean towards doing a non double grid mission just because you're going to reduce flight time significantly. And I'm not saying don't do that. It's all about what you're trying to do. So if I were to, if I needed to map a very large area, I would probably fly at a high altitude doing a single grid without perpendicular flight lines and go over the areas of interest that I wanted to map for three dimensions with uh, a much lower altitude and more oblique shots. And of course, making sure that I'm processing the imageries with the uh, high setting, the high quality setting in my photogrammetry processing software.